And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Looker. Today, William will be discussing trends in enterprise advanced analytics. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVAnalytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can follow William and each other at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Elena for a brief word from our sponsor, Looker. Elena, hello and welcome. And it looks like you're muted there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody today, I guess, or good afternoon, depending on where you may be. Um, it's not news to anyone that the market is shifting at breakneck speed. Uh, technologies that promise to revolutionize the way we use data have come and they've gone. And still, you know, we're sitting here thinking about how we can put the data we collect to work for our businesses. The importance of being able to take advantage of new and changing technologies really cannot be overstated, which means that the tools that we use have to be flexible enough to adapt to changes in the market, and our stacks need to be modular enough to let us swap out technologies when they no longer stack up. Our mission has always been to empower people through the smarter use of data. Today, over 2,000 companies partner with Looker to harness the power of their data and empower their people to drive successful business outcomes and deliver better experiences for their customers. This need for better experiences for customers has been the catalyst for digital transformation and really the technologies that support it. And the Looker platform is part of the solution that people are choosing for this. It's because of the ability to deliver timely, actionable insights and infuse data into business workflows that's really made this a go-to choice for these companies. Digital transformation is a profound shift in the way companies use technology to deliver value to their customers. It is, without a doubt, the number one, techno number one sorry, priority for technology leaders today. And as you can see in this graph, um, out of all the areas that drive digital transformation, the number one area of investment is data and analytics, proving just how pertinent this topic is for us today. Forrester calls the companies that are capturing this and doing this really well, insight-driven companies. These are the companies that are using data to drive growth and create differentiating experiences, products, and services. The idea is that data is not just something that we analyze, but actually something that can be infused into everyday processes to make employees smarter, give machines better data, and drive new streams of revenue. We're taking the concept of BI effectively and bringing it into the modern era, the era of the data-driven experience. Now, what is a data-driven experience? A data-driven experience can represent any number of ways in which companies drive value from data. That could be internal value by increasing revenue streams or optimizing the cost, or external economic value by monetizing data and generating new value streams. Looker's platform offers a unified surface to access the truest, most up-to-date version of your company's data. With this unified view into the business, you can choose or design the experience that makes the most sense for what you need. And ultimately, this creates the freedom to send governed data wherever you need it, whenever you need it. So Looker powers a number of data-driven experiences, beginning with the tried and true modern BI. Looker's world-class BI experience puts trusted, actionable insights into the hands of decision makers and helps cultivate a data culture throughout the organization. But as I said earlier, BI is just one data experience, and in all honesty, it's a small slice of a company's data strategy. 
we see companies working with data in incredibly innovative ways. They're weaving it into every part of their business in ways that go far beyond reports and dashboards. One of our customers, Future Play, is actually a great example of another type of data-driven experience. They've built a fully automated, AI-powered bid bot that optimizes their ad spend by automatically adjusting bids based on real-time performance, and all of this is being powered by data from Looker. Another one of our customers is feeding both legacy systems and data science and more modern data science workflows with governed data at a massive scale. This company basically modernized the IT services layer for their old systems, plus added new AI workflows all from a single platform. We also see leading organizations deliver data-driven experiences by just building a data product to truly capture the immense value of digital transformation now and get ahead of in competitive markets. We're even starting to see companies take that next step and begin to monetize their data. Ultimately, they're creating new revenue streams from the wealth of data that they're already sitting on. They rapidly build custom data solutions that fits the needs of their customers, adjusting as they go to account for changing trends in the market. For example, shifts in 2020. These case studies that I've told you about and that you can see at the top of your screen are perfect examples of how leading companies are delivering data experiences and shifting their focus from traditional reporting tools to platforms that integrate data into business operations and into data products. A modern approach to data and analytics requires a modern technology foundation. Looker was designed to take advantage of evolving trends in data infrastructure. The technology powering Looker is based on three main pillars, and that's these three concentric circles you see. Our in-database architecture leverages the power of modern cloud MPP databases that are significantly more powerful, far faster, and much cheaper than their predecessors. This live connection to the database provides a complete view of your data without having to move any of it into the application layer. Instead, we query the database in real time, so data is always accurate and it's always fresh. And what this ultimately does is it changes the ways, way that people are actually moving data into that database. It changes the way they're doing ETL to focus more on transforming the data at the time of query and less on in-flight transformation into the warehouse. Now, this paradigm is supported by the next concentric circle, our version controlled semantic modeling layer that acts as a centralized definition for all of your business rules and business logic. Effectively, we're separating business logic from physical data, which allows you to reliably apply consistent definitions across KPIs. So both the technical and non-technical can work with trusted data and also allows more flexibility as the data in your warehouse changes and grows. Wrapped around all of this are our APIs for data. These APIs are really the secret sauce that brings it all together because it means that you can give data and send data where it's needed most. These APIs give builders the tools that they need to deliver any experience anywhere. Custom apps, proactive rule-based alerting, scheduled reports, automated workflows, whatever it is. Um, and all of these capabilities are built on a flexible multi-cloud architecture. We strongly believe that organizations need to modernize at their own pace and be able to control their stack. We have a strategic commitment to multi-cloud approach because we believe it's critical for companies to choose the environment that works the best for them. And that's both today and in the future. So, I wanted to talk a little bit more about our architecture and I wanted to call out a few of the key pieces that really drive this ability to keep up with modern data trends. The first thing I wanna point out is this bottom layer. This is the idea that Looker sits in database and does transformation at the time of query. The key piece of this is that it allows you to maximize the value of the investments that you are already making in very advanced data stacks by adding to it and augmenting it, as opposed to pulling data out of those systems to try and put it into another space. Additionally, as you are able to upgrade underlying technologies as changes need or as you know, 
things come and go. Um, that's also possible because we're separating the business logic from the data engineering. The other piece of the stack I wanted to quickly call out is our API for data. Um, the ability to supply governed data at scale across IT services teams means that your data is un unlocked to the potential that you want it to have while still being secure in your system. The world of data is changing incredibly quickly, and so having a architecture that can support that is incredibly important. Um, and I would like to hand it over to William to talk to us more about the changes in coming up in 2020. Elena, thank you so much for this presentation, and thanks to Looker for sponsoring and help make these webinars happen. If you have questions for Elena, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, as she will be joining us in the Q&A section at the uh, Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our series speaker, uh, William McKnight. William is the president and of McKnight Consulting Group. McKnight Consulting Group focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems, utilizing proven streamlined approaches and in information management. His teams have won several best practice competitions for their implementations. He has been helping companies adopt big data solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello and thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Elena. That was really good, and I think a lot of the trends uh, are in, were inherent <clears throat> in your presentation. Um, and it's good to see that uh, Looker is doing uh, some of this. Um, you mentioned, Elena, you mentioned digital transformation as a big area of investment. I see that as well. I see that as the label for where a lot of organizations have to level up today to be competitive. And really what that comes down to, I like to say, you said it a little differently, I like to say that that's really all about improving your data maturity. And uh, as you mentioned, the number one area of investment in digital transformation is in data. So we're all in the right spot here uh, in our careers. Um, and I thank you all for joining uh, Advanced Analytics here in the new year. Now, a lot of people come up with their trends, their predictions, and so on in December, but here at Advanced Analytics, we like to wait until January when you're back to work, when you've put the holidays behind you, when you're really starting to think about this stuff. So here we go. Yeah, okay, a little bit about me. I think Shannon introduced me. Uh, we do strategy, we do training, and we do implementation work in all the things I'm gonna be talking about. Okay, so what are the trends? And I'm going to start with why are the trends important so that I get your attention for the rest of the presentation, number one, but so that you know why you need to start putting some of these things on the radar. I'm also going to get to what were my trends from last year and see, well, how did I do? And, and just give you a window into how far we've come. You know, sometimes it's hard to see how far we've come, how fast we've come when you're focused day to day and you don't ever step back. Well, this is a little bit of a step back kind of presentation, although I hope I'm putting things in play for each and every one of you, especially in terms of planning and doing some of the important things like platforming uh, your future applications uh, and so on. So why are trends important? Now, maybe you've heard me say this before, but I like to say it wherever I can. Beyond the mountain is another mountain. That's a Haitian proverb. And what I like to say about this is that as you see the mountains in the graphic here, it's similar to what we're going through right now. There's always another mountain. Now, unlike these mountains, uh, there are not new mountains obviously out there being grown before our eyes, but in technology, there are. <laughs> and you're never to the end, and that's gotta be okay. Because I talk to a lot of data professionals and they are waiting for this or that implementation to occur and then things will be settled. Um, I don't think so. I think this is an area where it's, it's going to be unsettled for quite a while. It's going to get more complicated, even more complicated before it gets less complicated. And there are some uh, signs on the horizon of some things that might uh, uncomplicate our world and I'll get to some of them, but still, I think we just got to be prepared. We got to be prepared. Now, a trend to me, uh, one of these 10 trends I'm gonna be sharing with you, a trend to me is not something that's here today, gone tomorrow. I've discarded those. 
uh, the trends that I'm going to be getting into are the ones that you really should think about putting in your roadmap and having a plan for each and every one of them in your company because there's a lot of investment out there from the vendor community, VC community, and so on that's going to go into these trends. And uh, the trends that are going to stick around are ones that you want to be a part of. You want to at least acknowledge what you're doing in every one of these trends. We're in the business of data. Um, this, uh, uh, this shows that our information is exploding. It's real time. It's becoming real time all the time. And it's not just selective data that's becoming real time. We're bringing analytics to bear at that point where the customer is standing right there at the, at the cash register or on your website, uh, et cetera, and making instant decisions. And it has, it has to be filled with analytics. And uh, to some degree, we really got to work on the back end uh, where the data resides and make that data cultivated to the point where it can be effective in this kind of environment. But it's our information that differentiates us from our competitors, our information quality that impacts everything, and our information is used and reused. And finally, information is a key business asset, which is going to lead to my first uh, trend for you here in about five minutes. Data maturity is highly correlated to business success. Now, this isn't the maturity presentation, but in my maturity model and other maturity models, there's like one, two, three, four, five. And what I like to say about this is, well, first of all, we're our companies. Don't fret. Uh, there are five in my um, extensive work in this area. Companies tend to fall into one of five distinct camps, uh, and that's why it's not an even distribution. Um, and there's many more ones than there are fives, very few fives out there. And I can explain one, two, three, four, five, maybe in another forum, but I found that about half or more of firms are at this very basic level of data maturity. Uh, data is certainly, certainly an area where you can make investment if there make investment, and if it's a wise investment, it's probably the best place that you can put investment in your company today. And by the way, every one of you should be striving to get to level three. And I'm not saying four or five, some of you need to be at four, frankly, but everybody needs to be at a level three, I think just for competitive purposes, because this is digital transformation. This is the area of competition today. And you can define for yourself what that number three means, uh, but I think we kind of all as data professionals inherently know where we stand on this in our shop. And if we each will work on our respective areas, bringing them up collectively, we might have a three and we might be able to sustain that. That's my hope for you. Maturity modeling like this, and I'll be quick about this, but it should give you a sense of priority. What comes next? What's important? How do other companies uh, do it? What, what, is, what has been their path? Because every, every one of you, and I, even if you're a best practice in some area, uh, I look at my clients, some of them are best practice in some areas. Nobody's best practice across the board. There's always a leader out there that you can be looking to at something. And uh, that should give you a sense of priority. Uh, what, what's the path? What's the path to that level? By the way, you can't skip levels and say, okay, we're one, let's, let's be a five this year. You know, it just, it takes a while, at least six months, I'd say, to, to move a level. And that's if you're doing things right. Maturity levels tend to move in harmony. Yeah, yeah, whatever you, however you categorize things, I use technology, strategy, architecture, and processes. And uh, your maturity will tend to move in harmony across those categories. You can't be like a one in, in governance and then a five in technology. Just doesn't work that way. Mid-sized and smaller companies, uh, I give you a little bit of uh, grace here. Uh, you might have, uh, you might strive to be a two, uh, but for most uh, people interested in enterprise data, it's a three. All need to be at a three. Momentum is paramount. Companies who need to be at four are those in highly competitive industries, and some of you are in those. So what, what, what's maturity modeling have to do with trends? Well, has a lot to do with trends because the things I'm going to place in your future today will level you up in terms of maturity. Our goal with this uh, nice little slide here um, is to raise the foundation of our company. We must. However we're doing things today, we cannot still be doing that, at least from a technology perspective, the same way next year. We all need to be leveling up 
our area of data management. So this is the reason we exist as technology professionals. So here's some good news for every one of you, okay? Every one of you is the best practice, so congratulations. Um, but what, what year are you a best practice for? So that's uh, the caveat to that, right? Okay, so if you're a best practice for uh, 1995, um, that's not so good. You're not a best practice today, okay? Um, hopefully that was uh, just, just humorous and taken in the right way. But I want you to be a best practice for some time in the last few years at least, uh, if not this year. So that's what we're striving to do, raise the foundation of our company so that we can it's the year closer for what we're best practice for. The money tree does not exist. Uh, speaking for myself, 20 years in consulting now, 20 plus years, I've never been given a budget for leveling up a company's uh, uh, maturity in, in data. It's always for something that the business wants. And uh, the trick is to do it in the right way, a scalable way, uh, an efficient way, something that gets them a timely result, but also does it right. So putting these trends uh, into the picture is something that you are challenged to do. And uh, oftentimes the business will come to a tech team and, and uh, I'm making a little differentiation here. I know some tech teams are quote unquote in the business, but what I mean by that is a technology professional, wherever they may be. Okay, so the business will come to this technology professional or tech team uh, with a solution and sometimes the method to get there and sometimes that's good sometimes it's not so i want to put you on your toes with these trends so that you can look for the opportunity to introduce these trends into your shop uh, many executives believe that data is an asset and want to be a data data driven company uh, you but you can't get there without tending to some of these trends i'm going to be talking about so why why do we want to do this we're just being asked to do a job, right? Well, here's what I found. Here's what I believe, you know, from for my data technology professionals and the ones in, at my clients, I believe that it's not simply good enough for a data professional to create user satisfaction. That's a part of it. That's a big part of our job. Uh, but we also must level up our area uh, with uh, data maturity and doing data maturity things uh, within our area so that we can get longer term things like longer term user satisfaction, things that drive ultimately business ROI. And I believe that for many organizations, people like us, data professionals that really need to be putting the projects on the table into the mix for the budgets and not sitting back and waiting for the business to do that. They don't know what we know. We are on that precipice of, of, of innovation and we are here today on this webinar, et cetera. We're getting aware of what the trends are and we're looking for opportunities to introduce them. So I would say go beyond looking, but actually be proactive and figure out how these things can play in your organization. So with all that preamble, let's look at last year's trends. I was on this webinar about a year ago and these were my trends from last year. I don't have as many this year, uh, not that I couldn't, but I just, I guess I got carried away last year, but how did I do? And more importantly than how did I do, how did we all do uh, in terms of the industry? And what are some of the things that did happen in our industry uh, that we need to be aware of and um, where have we come from? And I'm gonna be quick about this. My, my, my hope is not to spend a lot of time on last year's trends. Sensible division of analytic platforms, meaning, meaning we know that there's a difference between a data warehouse and a data mart, and some other analytical database and operational database, et cetera, MDM, and we're putting things much more sensibly into the right platforms. I'll give myself a uh, check mark on that one. Cloud storage overtakes HDFS, I think for sure. Uh, that happened at least in terms of provisioning for new things. Multi-cloud becomes the norm. Okay, so far so good. The year of master data management, 2019, I declared it the year of master data management. I think I was, a little premature on that. I think MDM continued to grow at its pace, maybe even excel at an, an accelerated pace uh, from previous years, but not to the point where I may have, should have made that declaration. 
it continues to grow forward. Uh, it might pop up in a trend or two here, but uh, maybe 2020 will be that year. Data virtualization being very important, providing the enterprise data fabric. I think we're all doing it now. I think we, we just can't have all data everywhere. And so virtualization over the top has become pretty important. Whether we have a special tool for it or not is another matter. 2000, 2019, the year of the graph. Yes, I, I, I think I did it on that one. It was the year of the graph. Uh, and it continues to go forward as the, well, the decade of the graph, I guess now. Um, yeah, so much to say about graphs. Stream processing begins to supplant ETL. I don't think it's supplanted any ETL. I think I misworded this, this recommendation here because I think um, for new applications that involve lots of big data, yes, we are doing that by stream processing and cloud storage, et cetera. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of replacement so far. So the word supplant was problematic in that one. Data's newest highest use will be training AI algorithms. Uh, no, it did, not, uh, it did not become the highest use. It's slowly becoming the highest use. As a matter of fact, I'm going to roll that one forward into 2020. So that's going to be one of my uh, 2020 trends. And uh, we're going to roll that one forward. Data visualization, uh, yes. Uh, its footprint escalated, so did footprints of everything, but I will have something more to say about straight up reporting and our love hate with that. Self service takes off. Um, I, did, I, I wouldn't say it, it took off in reality. I would say that it, it's taken off in terms of planning and in terms of what people want and what people now know they want and know they need in their organization because there's so much for data teams to do that doing the query and the reporting is not part of that charter anymore. Um, but it's going to take some time for it to take off in, inside of organizations. But we're on the right path for that. Chief data officer going mainstream, yes. Uh, we're doing more, much more of that. Organizations acknowledge chief information architect, chief analytics officer, um, uh, maybe, a, maybe a B on that one. Uh, a lot of organizations uh, do acknowledge this now and see the need for technology at a high level. Uh, whether they're embracing the CIA or the CAO or not is another matter. Uh, data science pioneers lock in. Now this is something we're not gonna know for a while, whether the ones who are embracing data science today are the ones that are going to ultimately succeed. It takes some time. I believe that's true. I believe that uh, 2019 and, and 20 here, right now we're in that sweet spot of Claiming, uh, our, claiming some ground, claiming some territory around data science for our organization in our industry, and now's the time to do that. Acknowledgement of the need for data deployments to be near the business unit. Uh, this has to do with people. Yes, much more, much more distributed uh, in organizations. Reduction in challenges poised by internal grist. Uh, this has to do with, uh, as a consultant, coming into shops, trying to make change, getting a lot of internal grist, and um, uh, resistance to change and seeing that kind of fall by the wayside because organizations must have this kind of change in order to survive and I think that is true. Analytic skills go into the operational environment. Yes, I think that's true. I think that's happened um, and I think that the, the line between operational and analytical is getting really blurry out there, getting really blurry uh, and there's a lot of applications that really straddle that fence. Operational big data platform selection to see more SQL with the rise in what SQL can do, less NoSQL. Uh, I think this is true, but I'm not, uh, I'm certainly not uh, signaling any, any death uh, toll here for NoSQL. NoSQL has grown tremendously as well. Uh, it's a very solid uh, way to deploy data in an organization. So it's still seeing its heyday, um, but we're gonna see more SQL. Uh, SQL is growing, databases are growing. And um, we're seeing even some pullback from cloud storage and things like that into good old databases. All right, and a new asset bio data uh, didn't quite happen the way that I had hoped for. There is a lot of evolution in healthcare. We're getting predictions now at the genome level. We have some leaders out there, companies that are using genomic analysis to learn diseases and provide preventive methods and so on. And I think the evolution of AI will continue to improve the quality of treatment and so on, and a lot of that will have to do with bio data, but uh, we're going to have to keep an eye out for bio data 
in our data sets of the future. Okay, now let's get to them. Top trends, I got 10 for you. First of all, data takes steps towards the balance sheet. Let's just start out with a doozy here, right? Um, this has been talked about sort of, I don't know, uh, at a low level for quite some time. Uh, I am certainly not an, ex an expert on the balance sheet and et cetera things, but I did sit down with my accountant for about an hour and talked about this and uh, ferreted out a few things I want to share with you because I do think that this is coming uh, down the pike, and I think we're going to see a major move in this direction this year. And here's what he told me. There are rules about assets, okay? And one of them has to do with putting a cost on the asset. And this is the big problem. This is the big problem with making data an asset for the balance sheet because it's really hard to do it. Do you put in costs for the hours that you spent collecting the data? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. There's really no accounting model for it today. And that's the big challenge. Moving on, another one is depreciation. The asset must be able to be depreciated, it must have a useful life. Well, data re retains its usefulness for quite some time, and depending upon what you're doing with it, um, it can retain that usefulness for decades. And, uh, but it does, it does tail off after some time, so this one is a hurdle, but it probably could be, uh, could be solved with a, with a great model. Context is another one. This has to do with the assets. Uh, being utilized in a similar manner across different circumstances across different companies. And somewhat this is true in that we're all doing reporting, analytics, uh, et cetera, with our data, we're solving compliance issues and so on, but there's a lot of things that we do with data. It's certainly no one size fits all except at a very high level. Will that win the day? I don't know. Um, but the, the key to this becoming true is the ability to assign a value to data. That's going to be the challenge. And we do have some things that have happened, uh, like in uh, some acquisitions, some M&A acquisition that, that we've seen out there. Value has been placed on data, such as the $26 billion acquisition of LinkedIn by Microsoft, which was widely accepted that the value of data had a significant role in that business, obviously. So the prediction here is at least somebody's going to try this this year to boost their value and they may or may not succeed, but it will be a major step in the direction of having data sitting on our balance sheets. All right, so the next prediction is about uh, sensor-based time series data. Time series data is taking off and uh, it has a lot to do with uh, internet of things and collecting data at edge points. And by the way, I'll have another recommendation or another uh, prediction about edge points are coming up. But time series data, think of it as a, a bunch of data points that measure pretty much the same thing over and over and over again uh, in time order with a timestamp on it. It's that and a lot more, but um, that is the basic way to think about time series data. And we are starting to need a lot more time series data to do the things that we want to do with data. The data that arrives is recorded as a new entry. It's not overriding data. And the data typically arrives in time order, in sequential order according to time. So time is a very primary axis for this kind of data. So this is a different kind of data because we are tracking changes to the overall system as insert and update, or I should say insert because it's not updating, it's not deleting, it's just continually accumulating. And so what I like to, to say about it is that it really gives, gives you a sense of where the system is, where the system is going, and how the behavior has changed over time, because you're getting data at a very fine grain level. Like, for example, if, you're, if you have a web application, every user is going to log in, you're going to track all that login act activity, that's time series data. So you're getting a lot of information there about your website. And this is true for a host of different, very interesting applications out there today, like self-driving cars, trading algorithms, smart homes, retail tracking assets and supply chain and so on, and tracking all sorts of, of vehicles. So time series databases, or I should say databases that have great time series capabilities, 
has steadily re remained one of the fastest growing categories of databases. So keep an eye out for that. Business intelligence interfaces are undergoing an upheaval. Uh, we are getting away from reporting, asking a user today in 2020 to go find the data and build reports. That just seems really antiquated. And I think that things like NLP, natural language processing, natural language inputs, are going to change uh, how we interface with our data uh, tremendously. Now, Bill Gates said earlier this year that natural language inputs and AI voice assistants will improve to the point that they might be able to fill the role of a human secretary. So um, yeah, we're all kind of secretaries when it comes to our data, trying to find data, uh, trying to make sense of it. So AI voice assistants, yes. Being more Google-like chat boxes, yes. That's going to be another way that we're going to interface with data. Uh, it's just going to change. I mean, if, if you think um, you know, reporting hasn't changed, it has. Uh, for example, we're not doing a lot of printing of reports and having somebody with a kind of a, a grocery cart <laughs> go around the organization dropping off uh, printouts. Um, I hope we're not doing that. Um, but, you know, slowly that has changed. And I think that this is sort of the next evolution in that, where users will have to be able to ask a question and get an answer and not be concerned about, well, let's, do I need to go to the data warehouse or the lake on this one? Or is that over here or over there? Uh, we just need to create a better infrastructure for them because this is going to be the demand. So we'll also see if, if um, tracking things like your eyeballs uh, against the uh, monitor is going to be something that is interesting, but that is something that Elon Musk, of all people, is working on. He has a startup called Neuralink which is one outfit working on brain computer interfaces that use our thoughts as input mechanisms rather than taking the time to type speak or gesture our commands. How about that? So I'm not saying that's gonna happen in 2020, but out there is potentially getting beyond even speaking, but tapping into our thoughts to give us answers. Very interesting. ETL will be nearly automated. Uh, this is happening already. Uh, the data discovery part of it is happening uh, already. And auto generating pipelines based on global experiences. So you can bring to bear the experience of 10, 20, 100, 200, 1,000 different experiences out there that needed that source to target map and uh, did it already. And did it in the cloud, uh, did it with a, a provider that has access to all of this and brings that to bear for you. The, ET, the job of the ETL architect, or I should say the data integration architect, is, is drastically changing. It's getting much more automated, and even the joins uh, across data is uh, becoming more automated. Uh, all of this is being done with the help of bots. So once the data is found, it's pretty straightforward from that point. We're getting away from manual uh, uh, interfaces, manual design, uh, the machine can learn from the things that we do and automate that for the future. Any ETL product that you are considering to be a foundational piece of your future should be doing this. Leveraging cloud object storage for data lakes. Yeah. Okay, I talked about cloud object storage being important and overtaking HDFS last year. This uh, trend is also bringing the data lake aspect into that and trying to say that data lakes themselves are becoming very important in organizations. So we're gonna see a lot more of this. I still think there's a problem. I think the, there's a problem still between data lakes and data warehouses, and I'm working on it. I'm thinking about it. Uh, I don't have the answer. If you wanna share some thoughts with me, uh, feel free. Um, but right now we are collecting a lot of data in the data lake, pushing a subset of that onto the data warehouse, uh, I see it as very necessary today for most organizations, but it, it's, it may be overkill in the future. But for 2020, let's build those data lakes. Our data scientists need it. Frankly, our data warehouses need that kind of a, a great staging area. And the cloud offers many capabilities uh, for our data lakes. So more achievable separation of compute and storage. Compute resources can be taken down, scaled up or out, or interchanged without data movement. 
storage can be centralized, but compute can be distributed, et cetera, what you see there. Um, yeah, some vendors also have remote data replication to ensure redundancy and recovery. So all of the, the great things that we want are finding their way into cloud object storage. Uh, definitely be utilizing cloud object storage in 2020. More edge AI. So here again, I'm kind of combining things here. More AI for sure. Um, but uh, more of that's going to happen out on the edge. So um, we're getting away from just having some, some file system on our edge devices, and uh, we're having real databases out there. So um, now, truth be told, if we're looking at databases across the world and what databases are deployed for, embedded databases would be far, far beyond um, what we're doing with non-embedded databases. There are just so many of them. And uh, now that we're growing to a projected 75 billion devices out there, I'm not, not saying all of them will have an embedded database on them, but many, many will. And the utility of having a database uh, there uh, is the beginning of having artificial intelligence being able to happen right there at the edge. And then communicate back with the, uh, the mothership, of course, but a lot of AI is just going to happen right at the edge. We're pushing it, pushing it all the way down there. So examples of this are like mobile airline applications with online check-in, boarding pass retrieval, et cetera. Um, yeah, these databases will check in with, uh, again, the mothership, maybe a data warehouse, something like that. Um, but the other point, the big point I want to make here is, is about AI in, in these devices. Uh, alongside the database. And that's where you have the power when you have AI and data side by side able to do things in real time with a ton of smarts. You have chip startups out there like Samba Nova, Graph Core, Cerebras, and Sintiam. These are companies that are developing architectures to handle uh, artificial intelligence. They're building high performance AI chips known as neuromorphic or brain chips, in case you see that. These mimic the structure of the brain and process the top AI algorithms. So just need to get the data together. And the AI is coming. And this leads to my next prediction for you here. Data's new highest use will be training AI algorithms. I said this last year. I, I mentioned before I'm rolling this forward. Uh, some I tossed, although most of the predictions were good for last year. This one's probably good for this year. They just knew as highest, new highest use will be training AI algorithms. Not running reports, not building dashboards, but training AI algorithms. I hope I'm not too early with this one once again, but this is where AI steps in and what we want to do with AI is know what the behavior is going to be change it if we want to and know that we're changing it to the way that to the behavior that we want from the counterparty so data collection is foundational to this and let me put that up there data is the foundation of ai uh, data i mean ai is on the data maturity spectrum as far as i'm concerned so you have to have your data maturity to a certain point before AI becomes viable, but it's never going to become viable uh, until, a, until your data is at that level of maturity. And data for AI, where is it going to be? It's going to be in a great architecture, great data architecture. It's going to be in the data lake, the aforementioned data lake. It's going to be in your data warehouse. It's going to be manageable. It might be cataloged, uh, which is not one of my top 10 trends, but it, it could very well be the 11th, the emergence of data catalogs. We're cataloging data at a rapid pace. We're understanding what data is in there. We're doing this for compliance reasons. We're doing it for regulatory reasons. We're doing it because it's great practice. It serves the user community. It, it helps create that self-serve environment that we're also striving for. So there's a lot there. The hardest part of AI is the data. It's cleaning up your data. So organizations are going to become algorithm libraries where they're trading algorithms, they're trading what works, they're cataloging, they're getting into ML ops, and AI is becoming very foundational 
to their future. Speaking of AI, another one on AI is explainable AI to reduce bias in the algorithms. It's going to, it's getting to the point where we just can't say to regulatory committees uh, with regulations like GDPR and CCPA, well, the computer told us uh, that, you know, we should take this action. Uh, we have to get in there and know. And I don't think this is actually going to slow AI down at all because I think what, from what I can tell, uh, this is being worked on and this is being done. So this is going to help reduce bias in the algorithms and reduction in so-called lazy AI, where we don't even really know how the algorithm works. We just throw it at the data and trust the results. We may not even be trying multiple algorithms and testing the results. But anyway, transparency is becoming part of compliance regulation. Transparency remains a hot topic and will continue into the new year as companies aim to ensure transparency, visibility, and the trust in AI and all AI-assisted decisions. We're going to see a lot of development and expansion in the so-called explainable AI movement, and that will be coming to a shop near you. A couple more. Kubernetes and containers. Well, this one is already moving in a, a trend direction, but uh, I thought I'd put it out there because I think it's uh, got a ways to go and we'll, we'll take off here and really be part of the wallpaper in 2020, where a data analytics stack will go to Kubernetes for both open source and commercial. Winners will go from thought to POC quickly. And this is really one of the big advantages of uh, Kubernetes and containers. It's giving rise to the uh, ability to spin up clusters for maybe big data, data warehousing, or machine learning, what have you, on a task-related basis. It's ephemeral. It's enabling a mentality of serverlessness. And the architecture is the substance of a lot of new platforms like what Cloudera is doing, like what Google is doing on their K8s and so, and so on. Ultimately, what this type of rapid prototyping is doing is it's enabling new workloads and new capabilities within organizations. So it's gonna go forward. Um, every single client I have is doing this to some degree or another and uh, I think it's just a matter of time before everything is thought of that way. Okay, my last prediction, and by the way, as I give you this one, um, if you have any questions for us, us, Elena or myself, about Looker or about these predictions or anything on your mind in relate, relation to data, we're gonna take that Q&A here in just a bit. But my last uh, prediction slash trend for you is about hybrid databases hybrid databases, kind of, a, kind of a throwback if you think about it. Back in the early days of databases, I was around then, um, the database was the database and it was used wherever uh, you needed a database. There wasn't a, there wasn't a big distinction between operational and analytical. Uh, there became one and it became very, very defined. And truly, uh, databases, most of them out there today, you just don't want to get it wrong, I'll put it that way. You don't want to be using an analytical database for an operational purpose or vice versa. But what about these hybrid databases that are coming on the scene now and saying, we're pretty good at both. Could hybrid databases take us back to that one size fits all due to the complexity of the current situation? We have to carry multiple skill sets. We have to carry multiple vendors and so on. Operational analytics is really the, and here we got some other names for it, Hybrid Transactional Analytical Processing, HTAP, Translytical, or Hybrid Operational Analytical Processing, HOAP. All right, these are some of the terms for this new breed of application that fits that fence straddling position that I talked about earlier when I said that the line's getting kind of blurred between operational and analytics today. Uh, you can't really do operations without analytics. Uh, for example, in, in a lot of things. So operational analytics cannot be done on a data warehouse that's loaded in batch from the previous day. It requires real-time analysis without data movement. And so today, a real focus and interest of operational analytics includes streaming data ingest and analysis in real time. So this is about real time. That's, that's part of it for sure. And you've got companies like Splice Machine, MemSQL, Actian, these are databases for those types of applications. 
You may or may not need ASSA compliance in that, check on that. But it's also for those shops that are interested in deploying a single database across the enterprise. And some do this uh, by deploying two types of data stores. So how, does this, how do these databases get away with it? Well, they might have an in-memory row store for their OLTP and a disk-based column store for their OLAP. And we all know by now column stores are best for analytics. So they differ in both storage format and the storage medium. So format being columnar versus row, medium being RAM versus disk um, or flash or SSD. So you can do joins across the various stores that, that may, may come out of a hybrid database type of strategy. But it's all about real time. So, now that you know some more trends um, and you're going forward as a data professional in your organization, um, you're not off the hook. This is the point to bring this type of thinking into some of the new plans. Maybe you have to discard some of them for now, but uh, hopefully not all of them because, as I mentioned before, trends are important. Now, before I leave you and we move to Q&A, there's more maturity in moving imperfectly than in merely perfect, perfectly defining the shortcomings. A lot of people can perfectly define the shortcomings, but what do we do about it? And will it work? Will the plan work to move us forward beyond where we are today? We must build credibility within our organizations. Not every organization is quote unquote data driven yet. And if you're, if you're uh, unlucky to not be in one of those shops, well, make your organization data driven. Show them the power build the credibility. Uh, you might have to go slow at first uh, because um, this may not be expected out of each and every data professional in an organization to do this. But I think it's, it's, uh, it may not be verbally expected or written down, but I think it actually is expected. So don't get caught up in that. Don't talk yourself out of beginning. Be open-minded. No plateaus are comfortable for long back to the mountains thing. Uh, and that resistance that you get about making progress, it's, uh, it's not about having the progress, it's about the journey. So you gotta spell out the journey so that you can do it bit by bit, step by step, and get into these trends and not be left behind. Which brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. I'll turn it back to Shannon to see if we have any questions. William, thank you so much for this great presentation and a great kickoff to the new year. Uh, just a reminder that if you have questions for William or Elena, to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send the follow-up email for this webinar by end of the day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recordings of this presentation. Um, uh, Elena, the question came in when you were uh, chatting uh, um, about Looker, how much work is needed to build the semantic layer? If I, have an, if I have a semantic layer built in another place such as Calibra or in another package such as Calibra, can I bring it into Looker? That's a great question. Um, and it kind of goes back to that ability to have multiple tools working at once. Um, Calibra is actually a partner of Looker's and you know, their data, catalog, data cataloging functionality is incredibly strong. Um, Loading it into Looker, I'm not sure on the specific details on that one. We could, we could get that for you if you wanted. Um, as far as how much needed is, how much work is needed to build the semantic layer, um, we have a generator for LookML. So as soon as we connect to the database, it generates a model based on the tables that it identifies, which will get you really off the ground and running. If you, now, like the magic of Looker and of LookML is being able to go in and customize that. And that can be as easy or as complicated and long as really as you want to. Um, the great news is that LookML is, based, is an abstraction of SQL. Um, and so it's a highly efficient language and also you know, very, very familiar to people who uh, know SQL. Um, so from that point of view, it's certainly a, you get off the ground easy and then you invest in your future. Love it. So uh, diving in here, you know, William, when you were talking about the data maturity, are you referencing the CMMI data maturity model? Or if not, is there a different discipline or a specific discipline you're mentioning? 
Well, I mean, I could be. I was just really referring to uh, data maturity as a concept. Um, that one certainly is is one that you could place right in there and say, uh, yes, that's uh, that's that's one that we will you know target. But there are others. I have one, for example, and so I was thinking about that one a little bit as well. But um, the point is to get to get to that point where um, you are, you know, at least on the lower end of really mature and uh, different models can help you in different ways. I'm not saying don't think, but I'm th use it as a catalyst to help you think about where you need to be and, and steps to get there and how to sequence all the stuff that you need to do. And Elena, anything about data maturity you want to add there? I think I really liked what uh, William said about not being able to, you know, skip a step. I think that it's really, really tempting to go straight to the really, like, kind of sexy stuff, like, right straight to, like, AI and feeding that into things, and which is super valuable and by no means has to be, you know, left till the end. Um, but I think investing in a strong foundation as you continue to go up that maturity curve will, you know, serve you in the long run to be able to really create that vision of digital transformation. And do either of you see any uh, trends, uh, you know, in data maturity standards uh, as it relates to this? William, maybe you want to kick it off? I mean, I, I just think that there's a renewed interest in data maturity because it's people are realizing that it's synonymous with digital transformation, which is what the, what, where companies need to uh, level up uh, their organization. Uh, and so there's a renewed interest in it. Um, I, I, I see more uh, organizations, maybe informally, but coming together around this notion of maturity. And even uh, information organizations are, are being given more leeway to bring that maturity up uh, you know, in absence of, of spending months to show the direct ROI of various things or various approaches that you might take uh, with business efforts, as uh, the executives of those organizations start to acknowledge that they need to be data, data, a data-driven company. I'd second that. Um, I think the other thing that, that we've really seen is in the past, I would say it's you know, in the past years, we've there's been a explosion of SaaS tools on the market, um, and I think people had this really strong desire, rightfully so, to be able to analyze their data and get insights from it, which caused a, uh, you know, everybody had seven different SaaS tools that were trying to do one thing, and people are realizing that a centralized, you know, unified approach to this that's more strategic and more long-run focused is ultimately going to be the winner in the game as opposed to trying to do the quick fixes of the SAS tools. Perfect. And we, I think we have time for a couple additional questions here. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, you know, there was a question in here, William, you mentioned early on, and this was one of your big predictions from last year, is master data management. It's been around for years, of course. So why are companies still not doing it? And what's the, the foundation of the resurgence? Oh, great question. Um, not for great reasons necessarily, but because it's hard. Because to, to do true master data management, um, there's always another way you can do it that's sort of a halfway, half measure. You know, you can do it the same old way. You can, I mean, or everybody's, I like to say everybody's doing MDM, they just may not be doing it very well because who doesn't need a master customer list or a master product list? Uh, but the unfortunate part is many organizations have 15, 20, 30, 50 such lists that are different. And that means they're all uh, out of whack. And that just right there, it's going to set the whole organization back, uh, as we can imagine from an efficiency perspective, from an effectiveness perspective, and so on. So uh, the reason it's, it's, it's a slow go uh, or has been a slow go is um, because you have to get different business departments to work together on something. The budget may not come from one department. And if it does, it's not true master data management. It's just serving one application, which is not uh, really, you know, enterprise MDM, which is, I think, what we're all talking about here. 
Elaine, anything you want to add to that? I think that William wrapped it up very nicely. Perfect. Well, that does bring us to the top of the hour. So just uh, thank you um, to both of you, William and Elena, for these great presentations and this information. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. And I hope you all have a great day and Happy New Year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, William. Thanks, Elena. Thanks, Thank Looker. You. Thank you.